Hello, my name is Nalani Brown, the philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones, reading the second chapter of Mozart's Starling by Leanda Lynn Hopped at the Point Defiance Rustin Senior Center. Chapter two, Mozart and the Musical Thief. Raising a baby bird is harrowing. It's difficult to duplicate the perfect conditions of a nest, and at any moment, something can go wrong. A slight variance in temperature one way or the other can cause a naked nestling to freeze or die of heat exhaustion. The lack of an essential ingredient in the diet can cause a failure to thrive and seemingly sudden death. Or a bird just might be sickly, as Carmen appeared to be, and not survive chickhood. The night after we stole slash rescued our baby starling, I had a nightmare. In it, I walked up a dream twisted staircase, through a doorway and into my own house. The bleeding bodies of almost dead starlings covered the floor. I woke up shivering and shook Tom. Oh God, oh God, oh God, Tom. This was a horrible mistake. Tom rolled over without breaking his snore. I threw on a robe, ran barefoot to my study, and shone my iPhone flashlight on the chick. I watched her breathe heavily. I checked the thermometer. A perfect 85 degrees beneath the warm red lamp, the warm red light lamp. I reached in and felt the chick's body, picked an errant knit. Then I pulled up a chair and watched the baby bird breathe until morning. Hovering constantly over Carmen in her early weeks, I envied Mozart, who'd had a pet starling but had skipped the angst of raising a chick. The bird vendors of Vienna did not sell their birds until they were sturdy and grown, and because it appears that Mozart's starling was singing a solid song on the day he bought it, we know that the bird had to be a full adult, probably at least a year old. Younger birds practice songs and mimicry but few are accomplished enough to sing a line from a Mozart concerto. And though it is impossible to be sure of the minute involved in the procuring of Mozart's starling, we do know many essentials, including the lively timeline. April 12th, 1784, Inerstad, Vienna. Mozart sat at the small desk in his apartment, dipped his quill pen, and entered the lovely piano concerto number 17 in G in his log of completed work. This was Mozart's 453rd finished composition. He was 29 years old. May 26th. Mozart received confirmation from his father, Leopold, that the fair copy of the concerto he had sent by postal carriage had arrived safely in Salzburg. Wolfgang wrote back that he was eager to hear his father's opinion of his work and of the other pieces he had sent. He was in no rush to have them back so long as no one gets a hold of them. Mozart was always a little paranoid that his music might fall into the wrong hands and be imitated or outright stolen by a lesser composer. As for what happened next, there are many possibilities, but it might have gone something like this. May 27th, Graben Street. Mozart's stockings pooled in wrinkles around his ankles, and he paused on the bustling roadside to pull them up. As he tucked the thin silk under his buttoned cuffs, he was startled by a whistled tune. It was a bright, sweet melody, a fragment beautiful and familiar. It took Mozart a wondering moment to recover from the shock of hearing the refrain, but when he did, he followed the song. The whistles repeated, leading him down the block and through a bird vendor's open door. There, just inside, Mozart was greeted by a caged starling who jumped to the edge of his perch, cocked his head, and stared intently into the maestro's eyes, chirping warmly. This bird was flirting. If there was one thing Johannes Christon, ooh, Johannes Christosimus Wolfgangus 
Theophilus Mozart responded to, it was flirting. When the starling did it again, he turned away from the composer, pointed his bill skyward, fluffed his shimmering throat feathers, and sang the theme from the Allegretto in Mozart's new concerto, completed just one month earlier and never yet performed in public. Well, he almost sang the tune. The starling made a minor rhythmic modification, a dramatic fermata at the top of the phrase, and raised the last two Gs in the fragment to G sharps. But the basic motif was unmistakable. The starling's mimicry is not surprising in the least, as birds in the mina, birds in the mina family, starlings are among the most capable animal mimics on earth, rivaling parrots in their ability to expertly imitate birds, musical instruments, and any other sounds and noises, including the human voice. But how did the starling in the shop learn Mo Mozart's motif? The composition was meant to be an absolute secret, not slated for public performance until mid-June, when it would premiere under Mozart's direction with the gifted young student from whom it was written, Barbara Ployer, at the piano. Mozart was so delighted by the starling, he almost forgot his shock. He and the bird whistled phrases back and forth, sharing snippets of their repertoires. Then, Mozart pulled out his pocket notebook and copied out the bird's species name, Vogel Starl, a version of the German name for the bird referred to as the European starling in North America and the common starling in England. One commentator claims that Mozart named his bird Star, a misreading of his note that simply referred to the species. Even so, it is handy to employ a moniker in telling a story. As there is no record of the bird's actual name, Star will do nicely. The story is not well known in its details, and some musicologists, acquainted with only the surface of the tale, claim that Mozart must have responded in a jealous fury to the bird's pirated rendition of his own composition. But when we look into the composer's pocket notebook, we see that nothing could be further from the truth. Beneath the words Vogel Starl, Mozart wrote his own version of the tune, then the Starling's version. Later, Mozart would refer to the bird by the more common spelling, Vogel Star. Today in German, the species is typically referred to as Vogel Star. There are scores of Mozart biographies in the world, and though they typically agree on the known facts, they all provide varied, contradictory views of the composer's personality. When veering into matters having to do with Mozart's nature of inner life, I focus as much as possible on what I have been able to glean from his own words as they, appear, they, as they appear in the hundreds of published letters and relied primarily on two fine translations, which I use interchangeably in this book. Mozart's Letters, Mozart's Life, with letters selected, edited, and translated by Robert Spartling, and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, a Life in Letters, with selected letters edited by Cliff Eisen and translated by Stuart Spencer. I recommend both volumes highly. His comment on the Starling's interpretation? Das war schon. That was wonderful. It would not have been at all odd for Mozart to keep a bird. Pet birds were popular in 18th century Europe part of the natural history trend that characterized enlightenment attitudes in polite society. Facilitated by an emerging international shipping trade, exotic birds such as parrots and minas, and minas, as well as animals ranging from wombats and kangaroos to great land tortoises, made their way into public menageries and into increasingly popular animal and bird merchant shops. Can peace be gained until I clasp my wombat? Dante Gabriel Rossetti wrote to his brother in 1869 while waiting impatiently for his new pet to make its way across the sea from Australia to England. Exotic birds were expensive. In the, in the Gregorian menagerie, 
cultural historian Christopher Plum writes that a parrot could cost as much as a typical servant earned in a whole year. And a bird selling was good business for high-end shopkeepers who could afford to have the exotic species shipped in from Africa and Australia. But it was the trade in native birds such as chaffinches, bullfinches, doves, and sometimes starlings that made pet birds accessible to a wider population, bringing both decorative and musical interest to the middle class salon. Little is known about the local bird catchers, many of them who've lived near poverty at the fringes of society. They would catch, raise, and sell birds to vendors with proper shops. Or sometimes they would sell the birds themselves along with simple homemade cages from seasonal street stalls rented with their last fennings. These were often family ventures with tatterdemalian youngsters set into the fields and woodlands to check progress on nests and eggs. Nestlings were pilfered and raised until they were grown, sturdy, and ready for sale. Though the work was socially unrespected, it was not unskilled. Local bird catchers might have been functionally illiterate, but they had to be accomplished natural historians, knowing how to identify and name species, find nests, and monitor the laying of eggs and the fledging of young. They had to know how to hand raise birds, diagnose health, health issues, and sometimes cure them. They had to be thieves, scientists, veterinarians, and business people all at once. And yet, as Plum points out, most of what we know of these tradespeople comes from court records in which they are accused of drunkenness, robbery, or petty crimes. It seems they were never considered part of the society in which the birds they raised found homes. It was surely one of these skilled ruffians who hand raised the starling Mozart chose before it arrived at the shop. The bird was tame and friendly and the practiced shopkeeper had no trouble catching it and depositing it, depositing it in a small wooden box lined with natural glass, grasses that Mozart carried home to his wife, Constance, whistling all the while. Mozart's walk was a short one, but the noonday streets were bustling with horses, wagons, and hackney carriages. Several of the city's many homeless dogs brushed their legs brushed his legs, but they ignored the maestro and his mysterious box, intent on getting to the stalls of the street vendors who migrated from the suburbs each morning with their offerings of eggs, meats, cheeses, and wines. A well-behaved dog who sat quietly would get plenty of scraps. There was a high piled hair and the flouncing of hoop skirts, now in their last decade of popularity. There was a fragrance of roasting chestnuts and the smoke of kitchen fires and the manure from the carriage horses. There was, occasionally, the song of a street musician. On a normal day, Mozart had an eye and ear for all of his life. Life everywhere was a thing to be drunk up and poured out again in his music. But this day, he took no notice of anything. His mind was all on the little box. Mozart whispered to the bird within, maybe telling him about his new home. Meanwhile, Star, who loved this man's voice in the shop, was now huddled in the darkest corner of his tiny crate, wide-eyed and silent. He was tame, yes, but no starling likes to be stuffed into a coffer and carried about. The poor bird was terrified. Soon, Mozart reached his apartment at 29 Graben, a fashionable address. The Graben was then, as now, the central shopping and fashion district. The Mozart's rooms were not spacious, but it was just the two of them, Wolfgang and Constance, along with their small dog, Gockerl, and now Star. Perhaps Wolfgang thought his new bird might bring a cheering presence to the house. The couple's first baby, little Raymond Leopold, had died the previous year when he was just six weeks old. He had been in the care of a wet nurse while Constance and Wolfgang were in Salzburg, visiting the elder Leopold. Mozart's attempt to sow goodwill between father and wife 
Though Leopold had never met Constance, he was against the match from the start. The couple had left Raymond fat and happy, and Mozart blamed the child's death on their decision to raise him on breast milk rather than water and coarse milled oats, as was commonly and disastrously recommended by the medical men of the era. That May afternoon, when Wolfgang turned up at the Graben apartment with his starling in a box, Constance was five months pregnant with their second baby. The child would be named Carl Thomas, and of the Mozart's six children, he was one of just two who would survive to adulthood. It sounds shocking and sad, but this survival rate was a bit above average. In my imaging, Constance was bemused and also a bit put out at the new housemate. What pregnant woman needs something else to be taken care of? But she could not have been surprised. She knew that her husband had been fond of pet birds from childhood, singing canaries mostly. Any, cons Any consternation she felt was dispelled by Wolfgang's unbashed joy. Star was unnerved by a short journey, but settled quickly into his new cage as these intelligent birds do, without much thrashing about. Wild foods and seeds were typically sold at bird shops, but most likely, Star simply shared the family diet, feasting on bits and leftovers from Mozart's table, fed to him by hand or left in his cage. Starlings are omnivores, and the varied scraps from an 18th century middle-class um, Viennese kitchen, meat, potatoes, fruit, and plenty of pastries probably offered just the right fat protein balance for Little Star. Carmen loves to nibble our leftovers. Her favorite includes lentils, spaghetti, and couscous salad. It is not known whether Constance had any childhood pets, but since her father, Fridolin Weber, was a restive jack of all musical trades, their lifestyle was probably too unsettled for animals. Constance, who grew up in the cultural and intellectual center of Mannheim, was the second of four Weber sisters, all of whom had classically trained voices. During Constance's teen years, the family moved frequently to promote the singing career of the eldest sister, Aloysia. Mozart was born and reared in provincial Salzburg, but traveled widely throughout Europe as a child prodigy performing on the violin and pianoforte alongside his sister, Maria Anna, always called Nanurl, a brilliant pianist in her own right. The children were usually accompanied by both parents on these long and expensive journeys, which were fraught with the many dangers of carriage travel, poor roads, inclement weather, exposure to disease. Wolfgang was often sick and near death more than once. His short stature was the subject of public and medical comment and a concern to Leopold. Ill health would plague him always. There came a time when Leopold would no longer shirk his duties as Kapellmeister to Prince, to Prince Archbishop of Salzburg in order to parade his young prodigies about Europe. So, beginning in 1777, Mozart's mother, Anna Maria, chaperoned the 21-year-old Wolfgang on a 16-month journey without Leopold. Nanurl stayed behind with her father to look after the household. The first months were spent in Mannheim, and then, at Leopold's urging, mother and son continued to Paris. While Wolfgang gallivanted about the city, teaching, composing, giving recitals, dandying, and attempting to ingratiate himself with potential patrons among the royalty and aristocracy. Anna Maria, who could not go about unaccompanied in polite society, languished in their dank rooms. The stairs are so narrow, she wrote to Leopold, that it would be impossible to carry up a claver. A clavier. Wolfgang cannot compose at home. I never see him all the long day and I shall forget it altogether how to talk. She fell ill in Paris and died fairly quickly, a tragedy from which Mozart's spirit never fully healed. Young Mozart, alone in Paris with the body of his mother, could not bring himself to tell his father and sister what had happened. 
He lied in a letter to Leopold. I have to bring you some very distressing and sad news, which is the reason why I couldn't reply earlier to your most recent letter. My dear mother is very ill. She was bled, just as she had it done always, and it was indeed necessary. Afterward, she felt somewhat better. He engaged a friend in Salzburg to break the news to his father and didn't write to Leopold with his own version of the truth for over a week. I hope that you and my dear sister will forgive me for this small but necessary deception. When I thought about my own pain and sadness in relation to how it might affect you, I simply could not bring myself to overwhelm you with this distressing news. Vestiges of guilt and worry later emerged in his doubting, anxious anxious concern for his wife, whom he could not bear to leave, for his children, for his dog, and yes, for his starling. There's a heartbreaking oil portrait of the Mozarts that was commissioned after Anna Maria's death. The two grown children sat in the for- at the forte piano. Their father, Leopold, stands in shadows with his violin, and their beloved mother appears behind them in an oval frame painting, her hair piled high and wound wide and wide and wound with a blue ribbon. This portrait of the family is a powerful and ghostly presence at the Mozart Gebustus Gebertstaus house. Hung in the back of the dark, windowless, wood-rich room where Wolfgang was born. It is a bit discom- discomfitting to explore the rest of the exhibit with the family watching, rustling and whispering and mourning there in the corner. After his mother's death, Mozart continued to travel extensively, but Salzburg was home base. As Mozart's genius crystallized in his early 20s, the town began to feel too provincial to hold him. With difficulty, he tore himself away from his fretting but highly intelligent father. Leopold is misunderstood in the modern Mozart mythology. His difficult points, officiousness, anxiety, codependency, and condescending micromanagement of his family activities are well documented. His controlling nature is so over the top that it's almost funny, and there are thousands of examples of it in the family correspondence. When Anna Maria and Wolfgang were off traveling, Leopold wrote constantly, instructing his fully competent wife on the, mi- on the minute of business in life. He writes, wherever you are, always make sure that the innkeeper puts the boot trees in your boots. The music can always remain in the front, in the trunk, but you should buy a large oil cloak to use both this and the old one to wrap it well in order to ensure that it's really safe. I shall send fresh socks by postal carriage. But Leopold loved his family rashly and dearly. He thoughtfully homeschooled his children, not just in music, but in all subjects. He was a fine composer and a well-known violin pedagogue and a widely known violin prodigy throughout Europe. Without Leopold, we would never have heard of of Wolfgang Mozart. Even so, the relationship between father and son would always be fraught. As Mozart grew into a young adult, Leopold could not keep him from insinuating himself into every aspect of Mozart's life. No matter where Wolfgang traveled, Leopold would send letter after disapproving letter, insisting that Wolfgang find more ways to integrate himself with the aristocracy, improve his connections with famous composers, and always make more money. The letters were full of detailed advice on exactly how Wolfgang should go about accomplishing all these things. His love for Wolfgang shone through without fail, yet he could not help constantly reminding his son how much the family had laid out for travel and clothes and lodging in service to Wolfgang's genius. He deployed a complicated cloud of guilt, love, and indebtedness that followed his son everywhere and always. After his wife's passing, Leopold became even more clingy, anxious, and controlling, and Wolfgang's desire to leave Salzburg did not help. Mozart provoked his own dismissal from his underpaid employee with Salzburg's Archbishop, Colorado, 
and fairly ran away to Vienna, leaving his talented sister behind in the thrones of depression. Nanerl was now the keeper of her father's household and knew she had only two options open to her, live as a respectable spinster or marry. Both options required that she give up her life as a musician. Leopold was focused entirely on Wolfgang and no longer promoted his daughter's talents. She spent days in bed, suffering under the stark truth of what her life was to become. Eventually she would marry, though not happily. The spectacularly, the spectacularly talented Nonural stopped playing the piano forte. When Wolfgang and his mother were in Mannheim, they met the musical Weber family. Mozart scarcely noticed Constance, bestowed as he was by the eldest sister, Aloysia, with her fashionable beauty and her diva's soprano. Mozart concocted a wild plan in which he would run away with Aloysia to Paris and compose arias for her pure voice that would make them both famous. He wrote all about it to his father. Would Leopold tell him what a prima donna earned in Verona? Poor Leopold. When he read Wolfgang's long missive outlining the native scheme, he fell into absolute fits. My dear son, he wrote, I've read through your letter of the fourth with bewilderment and shock. Leopold claimed to be so distressed that he had not slept the entire previous night and as a result was so exhausted that he could hardly write and struggled with each word. He did not, this did not stop him from composing a letter that was dozens of pages long, expounding in great detail of the folly of his son's plan, which seemed to Leopold like a far-fetched fantasy that would make social lepers of the entire family. How could you allow yourself even for a moment to be taken in by such an appalling idea, to cast aside your reputation, your old parents, your dear sister, to expose me to mockery and yourself to contempt? Finally, he turned to his favorite method of twisting the knife, guilt. Remember me as you saw me when you left us, standing wretchedly beside your carriage. Remember too, that although a sick man, I'd been up till two o'clock doing your packing and was at your carriage again at six, seeing to everything for you. Afflict me now if you can be so cruel. But in the end, Leopold didn't need have, but in the end, Leopold needn't have worried, at least not about the eldest Weber daughter. Aloysia swiftly jilted Wolfgang and married the more mature, financially solvent, and much taller, Joseph Lang, an actor, singer, and portrait painter. Mozart, meanwhile, traveled all over Europe composing and performing, and eventually returned to Vienna, where the Webbers now lived. Her Weber had since passed, and Frau Weber was taking in boarders to help make ends meet. Mozart roomed at the Weber home for some weeks, and during this time, he tidily transferred his affections from Aloysia to her sister Constance. Wolfgang's affections for Constance might have been less youthfully wild than his infatuation with Aloysia, but they were sincere. He intended to marry her. Leopold was in a disapproving tizzy over the impending nuptials, nuptials. For years, he had been meticulously plotting the course of his son's fame. Now, Wolfgang wanted to derail his own chances for renown and esteem by marrying and into a family whose name meant nothing, who had no money, no prospects, no sons to ensure future income. Oof. Leopold despised the lot of them, sight unseen. But Wolfgang was 25 years old and ready to settle down. He was comfortable with the Webbers and those simple and through simple proximity, he and Constance had developed a dear friendship. And then, over the months, an intense affinity. He wrote to his father with trepidation, but was firm in his resolve. The middle one, my good dear Constance, is the martyr of the family. And probably for that very reason, is the kindest hearted, the cleverest, in short, the best of them all. 
Hoping to appeal to Leopold's concerns over economy, he emphasized Constance's practical virtues. I must make you better acquainted with the character of my beloved Constance. She is not ugly, but also not really beautiful. Her whole beauty consists of two little black eyes and a graceful figure. She has no great wit, but enough common sense. She is not exaggerant in her appearance. Rumors to that effect are totally false. To the contrary, she is in the habit of dressing very simply, and most of the things a woman needs, she can make herself. Indeed, she does her own hair every day. She knows all about householding and has the kindest heart in the world. I love her and she loves me with all her heart. Now tell me whether I could wish for a better wife. Constance had plenty of wit. She possessed an artistic spirit and a solid temperament. And in spite of the largeness of her husband's personality, she held on to a sense of bright independence. She traveled and managed parts of the household music business. Mozart wrote songs for her lovely soprano voice. She governed the couple's ever-changing financial, financial situation as well as anyone could and maintained relative equanimity amid the chaos of, of composing, parties, recitals, pregnancies, children, and the labors of middle-class 18th century domestic life in dusty Vienna. Doing one's own hair might not sound so impressive, but it was common even among the middle classes to have a for sure make home visits to do up the hairstyles of both men and women's hair on wigs. Though Leopold, Leopold was predisposed to find fault, even he commented on Constance's common sense home economics after his visit to the young couple's apartments. Wolfgang and Constance's marriage was not without troubles, but is a sweet one and happy overall. Starr joined the family in the middle of the marriage during the most musically productive, prosperous, and engaging years of Mozart's life. He might have been the smallest member of the household and is barely mentioned in most biographies, if he makes it in there at all. But the Starling is never far from the center of Mozart's unfolding story. Any Mozart historian would give an arm for this bird's eye view of these years. Starr's vocal acrobatics, accompanied by the composition of at least eight, eight piano concertos, three sympathy symphonies, and the marriage of Figaro. He was present for Leopold's 10 week visit to the young couple's house and the only visit the elder Mozart would ever make. Starr heard and likely joined in singing with the debut of Hayden Quart Quartets, performed in the parlor with Papa Hayden himself in attendance. Starr was present in the house during the birth of Carl Thomas in 1784 and Johann Thomas Leopold in 1786. He witnessed with his inquisitive Starling's eye the morning in the household when tiny Johann Thomas died at just three weeks old. Starr had been considered a footnote to the Mozart biography, but after living with a starling, I've become convinced that the bird brought a constant current of liveliness, hope, and good cheer into these complex years, one that sustained Mozart's heart and music. Three years after Mozart brought Starr home, his father, Leopold, passed away, leaving his son with a knotted mixture of guilt, mourning, and relief. Mozart did not travel to the memorial in Salzburg, where Leopold was buried without mourners. Mozart's starling died just two months later, and in honor of the bird, Mozart organized a formal funeral, donned his most elegant finery, recruited friends as velvet-caped mourners, and penned an affectionate elegy. My favorite translation is Marcia Davenport's from her 1932 biography of Mozart, now out of print. It captures the simultaneous jo jocularity and formality of the little verse. After a few lines that announce the starling's death, Wolfgang laments. Thinking of this, my heart is a riven apart, is <clears throat> Thinking of this, my heart is riven apart. O oh, reader, shed a tear, you also hear. He was not naughty, quite, but gay and bright. 
and under all his brag, a foolish wag. The poem shows that Mozart had become thoroughly acquainted with the typical Starling personality. Bright, personable, charming, mischievous. Some historians have claimed that the funeral verses are simply a farce, but no one has lived with a Starling, but no one who has lived with a Starling would dream of making such a suggestion. Chapter three, Uninvi Uninvited Guest, Unexpected Wonder. When Carmen was four weeks old and flapping about her aquarium, I realized that she needed a larger home. We moved her downstairs into a big cage on wheels. She still spent hours each day outside the cage, cuddling with all of us and practicing her emerging flight skills. Starlings are insatiably social and Carmen would call pit piteously when we were out of sight. When she needed to be in the cage, on hot days when we had to have the windows open, or whether we were cooking in the kitchen with dangerously boiling water, or when we were eating and wanted to keep her out of our food, we just wheeled her into wherever we were in, in the house so she could see us and chatter with us. By about this age, starlings have pretty much finished growing. They get, if anything, a little small, smaller as they mature, shedding baby fat and acquiring an adult sleekness. But they do get busier and more active. Though Carmen's cage was the largest I could find, I couldn't imagine her keeping I could not imagine keeping her there for long. My super handy dad, Jerry, came to stay with us for a few days to help me design and build a custom aviary in the corner of our mud room, a room within a room. I made sure Carmen's cage was in view as we worked so she could observe so she could observe our progress on her new home. Maybe if she watched it being built, it wouldn't seem too big and ominous when she moved in. We made a sturdy frame with two by two inch raw cedar posts, used lighter one by twos for struts, and neatly stapled metal grid, hardware cloth as it's called, to the outside of the structure, rather than the inside to keep Carmen from getting her toenails stuck in the staples. We fit the whole enclosure in the corner of the mudroom, a spacious throwaway between the kitchen and dining room so that Carmen could see us and hear us in the places where we spent most of our time. The aviary reached from the floor to the ceiling and all, and the back wall ran along a huge window with a view of trees, birds, and sky. The raw wood and metal had a, pleasure, a pleasing natural look and I added tree limbs for perches. It's important to do some research before using natural limbs in a bird's home as some bark is toxic to the species. It took two days of dawn to dark cutting and pounding, several trips to the hardware store, and lots of swearing on the part of my dad. But finally, the beautiful aviary was ready. Jerry and I surveyed our handiwork, high-fived, and poured a celebratory beer. But Carmen was wary. Star starlings are like cats. Though they are brave and inquisitive, they also like routine. And this was a whole new world. While Jerry finished his beer, I decided it was time to introduce our little bird to her new home. I stood in the aviary's doorway with Carmen on my shoulder. Her eyes grew large. I stepped inside and stayed there with her among the branches so she could get her bearings. I could feel her feet tighten uncertainly on my shoulder, but after about 15 minutes, I gently coaxed her onto a branch and slipped out the door. She squeezed into the highest corner and stayed there, silent and overwhelmed, for about an hour. The next hour, she began to explore quietly. By the third hour, Carmen had taken full possession of her aviary and was hopping confidently from perch to perch. There are tiny mirrors and all kinds of toys that I switch out daily to keep her interested. Her favorites are empty milk cartons on the floor that she can overturn and stomp on and plastic bottles that she can practice rolling around on. There's lots of room to fly and explore. As frequently as possible, I leave the door open so she can come and go as she likes. But even then, she will often just hang out in her aviary, sometimes flying between my shoulder and her favorite branch and back again. Good flying, I tell her, wanting to encourage healthy exercise. The aviary is her home, her safe place. When she is alarmed or bored or sleepy or preening after a bath, that is where she wants to be. 
and when she steals things from the household that she's not supposed to, like thumbtacks or money, that is where she goes to hide them. We designed the door to be big enough for humans to walk through, for ease of cleaning, and as we worked, we decided to make it a Dutch door. Two half doors, one on top of the other. We thought this would make the door less unweedy, unweed, unwieldy and help it maintain its integrity on the hinges over time. But it turns out to be one of Carmen's favorite things about her home. She likes to have the top door open so she can perch on the closed bottom door and survey her domain. She is a bit shy of new people and this is where she prefers to sit on her split level door when guests visit. Here she can take a good look at the interplorer, but still be able to make a quick getaway to the comfort of her favorite branch inside, the aviary, if she gets scared. Meanwhile, it is a nice place for guests to view her working, her, view her without looking through caged wires. Soon after we finished the aviary, Carmen began her first molt. From her plain gray juvenile plumage to her first adult plumage. Every day she became more spotted and glistening. One of the most frequent comments I hear about Carmen is, but she's so pretty. This isn't what all starlings look like. It seems that because starlings are so despised, they are also expected to be ugly or at least plain. Carmen is more beautiful to me than other starlings because I know her personality and have grown fond of her. But as starlings go, she's no great looker. If anything, She's a bit spindly, as her pectoral muscles are not well formed due to lack of extended flight. She's tidy and clean, but so are healthy young birds. I think the thing that surprises most people about Carmen is her glitteriness. Like all starlings, Carmen's plumage is iridescent, muted black when seen from one angle, but coming to shimmery life when seen from slightly different ones or in certain slants of light. Starlings are painted like oil slicks, layered with shining purple, blue, magenta, and green. Iridescence in feathers is created through structural changes in the feather surface that make them appear vibrant at certain angles. Microscopic bumps and ridges on the barbed and barbules refract and scatter light. The groguette of a hummingbird, garnet at one glance, brown at another, is the crown jewel example. When starlings molt in the fall, many of their fresh iridescent feathers are tipped with white, giving the birds their celestial pattern. But the structural changes that make starling feathers iridescent also give the feathers added strength, protecting them from extremes of light and weather. Without the reinforcing beneath benefits of coloration, the, scar the starlings' white tips wear off in the winter, leaving the birds all glistening black in the spring. It's a unique strategy for acquiring breeding plumage. Most songbirds molt into bright new breeding feathers to attract a mate in the spring. But starlings simply wear away their white to come up with a glimmery new look for the season. To birds, most of which can see on the ultraviolet spectrum invisible to humans, iridescent starlings' bodies literally glow. Even if you don't have UV vision, a starling in sunlight is absolutely stunning. I've heard some naturalists question this, but Carmen was a perfect experiment. Her first complete autumn molt filled the house with clouds of feathers. It is astonishing how many feathers are layered onto one little bird, about 3,000 on a starling. It was a nerve wracking few weeks for me. Every time I came home, Delilah would greet me at the door with feathers in her mouth, and I'd rush to Carmen's cage while searching the floor for blood and bird entrails. But she was happy and always safe like floor for blood and burden. Like most cats, Delilah just enjoyed playing with feathers. Once I survived the psychological torment of the molt, I admired Carmen's fresh, starry breast. Come spring, all her wild colleagues had lost their white tips, but Carmen's, protected from the elements, were as pristine as ever. It is intriguing that a bird so common, likely the bird most often seen by city dwellers, is so little understood or even recognized. In spite of the starling's unique sparkling plumage, the majority of people, including urbanites who live alongside starlings every day, cannot accurately identify them. 
Many confuse starlings with the much less sparkly blackbirds or even with baby crows. All three of these birds are in the large order of so-called songbirds, but other than that, they are not closely related. And baby crows, once they are walking about, are no smaller than adult crows. The starling species common in North America is the European starling, one of the world, one of the old world Sternidae family, a group that includes more than 100 species of starlings. Minas and oxpeckers are spread across Europe, Asia, and Africa. All starling species are shimmery, pre shimmery precocious, terrestrial, gregarious, vocal birds. All of them iridescent, many of them extremely colorful. Shades of cobalt, magenta, and brightest yellow. The superb starling of East Africa is among the most stunning small birds in the world, with brilliant turquoise and black plumage and shining gold eyes. One of them stole a piece of my sandwich as I was picnicking beneath a tree over looking Lake Maniara in Tanzania. At first, the starling seemed quite polite about it, stepping up and tilting its head to one side, looking at me with its sun yellow eye. I half expected him to say, May I please have just a bit of crust? Perhaps a nibble of the lettuce? But then he jumped in and took a bite so fast I hardly saw it happen. The native range of the European starling extends across all of temperate Europe and West Asia. But the species has been introduced in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Argentina, and North America. And the birds have spread just about everywhere else except, thankfully, the neotropics, where their impact on delicate native songbird populations could prove devastating. Regarding the presence of starlings in North America, some blame Shakespeare. In the 1800s, acclimatization societies began to form across the country, following successful models in France. It was a vulnerable time for many newcomers to America who were homesick and hungry for the arts literature, flowers, and birds of their homeland. The aim of the societies was to introduce European species that would be interesting and useful to the seemingly deprived New World species that would offer aesthetic and sentimental inspiration through beauty and song. Eugene Scheiflin was a pharmacist who lived in the Bronx. He was an eccentric, an Anglophile, and a Shakespeare aficionado. Some say he was also an ecological criminal and a lunatic, but I would argue for a gentler description, perhaps flawed. As deputy of the American Acclimat Acclimat Acclimatization Society of New York, Shiflin, it is believed, latched on to the personal goal of bringing every bird mentioned in the works of Shakespeare to Central Park. Armed with his treasured copy of the exquisite Ornithology of Shakespeare, an 1871 volume in which James Edmund Harding assembled every allusion to bird life in the whole of Shakespeare canon, Shivelin zeroed in on the bard, the bard's single reference to a starling in Henry IX. It is a decisive scene. King Henry commands that he will full soldier Hotspur free his prisoners. But Hotspur replies that he will do nothing of the kind until the king agrees to pay the ransom that will free the Hotspur's brother-in-law, Mortimer, from the enemy. The king flies into a fury and forbids him to mention Mortimer's name. After the king's exit, Hotspur imagines a fanciful retribution, and here enters our star. He said he would not ransom Mortimer, forbade my tongue to speak of Mortimer, but I will find him when he lies asleep, and in his ear, I'll holla, Mortimer, nay, I'll have a starling shall be taught to speak, nothing but Mortimer, and give it him to keep his anger still in motion. Shakespeare was attentive to bird life. Larks, nightingales, and chaffinches wing and sing their way through the plays and sonnets. And in his unique ornithology, Harding cataloged everyone and quoted the lines in which they appear. 
the acclimatization societies did in fact try to bring in many of these species. But with the obsessive powers of a true eccentric, Shiflin fixated on this one slender reference to the starling. Introductions of Shakespearean chaffinches, nightingales and skylarks, and earlier efforts by Shiflin to establish starlings had rescued in nothing but cold, starved, dead birds. Eugene resolved that his next starling attempt would not fail. In 1890, he paid out a pricely sum for his private stores, surely enough to satisfy Mortimer's ransom, to purchase 80 starlings from an English source. And he perhaps laid out a bit extra to ensure that he would be well tended to on their long journey to the New York port, where Shiflin met them in person, enlisting help from his housemen to carry their crates. He released his bewildered birds on a snowy March day in the middle of Central Park. I think of him there, gloved, worried, flushed with hope and honest, if misguided, love. The release could not have been all he'd envisioned. The birds would have been tentative in the cold and the snow, perching uncertainly in the leafless maples. This was not the romantic bursting into flight that Shiflin had surely imagined, but Eventually, the birds lifted into the gray winter skies. Genetic research and sample populations across the continent leads ornithologists to believe that all of the 200 million some starlings in North America, including my little Carmen, are descendants of Shiflin's birds. It's interesting to note that out, our starlings have quantifiably less genetic variation than starlings in their native European range. This is the line in which evolutionary biologists call the founder effect, in which the number of animals introduced, in this case, Shiflin's 80 odd birds, is not large enough to contain all the genetic variation of the original population. The spread of the starling was swift and complete. The Central Park birds dispersed into an emerging starling Shangri-La. They were accustomed to human presence and habitation in their home in England. The young city of New York would not have phased them in the least. Some birds stayed close to Central Park. Others flew to growing neighborhoods that provided warmth, sheltered buildings and perches above heated chimneys. Food, human leftovers in leafy parks inhabited by tasty grubs and insects. Nesting places, cavities created by buildings, building cornices and exhaust tubes, and ample foraging, grassy expanses in parks and gardens. Their progeny spread to other developing towns, first nearby, then farther and farther across the land. More descendants flocked to agricultural areas where they easily found sustenance in the form of grain and fruit crops. Starlings exhibit every characteristic of a successful animal invader. They are robust, aggressive, omnivorous, and unfussy about nest spots, and they reach sexual maturity at just nine months. They reproduce prolif prolifically, with two clutches per season, sometimes more, and raise large broods of four to six chicks. One clutch is the norm for most migrant songbirds, though non-migratory resident birds in temperate climates, like robins and chickadees, will often raise two broods. Starlings are inquisitive and intelligent, which, which makes them adaptable and ready to explore and colonize new places. We know that curiosity killed the cat, and to make up for this, cats are granted nine lives. It is difficult to imagine a more brazenly curious creature than the starling. And to balance things out, it seems that they ought to have 9,000 lives. People who live with starlings know this. There is a website administered from New York City called Starling Talk, where people who have starlings as pets gather to discuss matters such as the raising of baby starlings, starling health and diet, and the general wild craziness of life with the starling in the house. Nearly all the starling talkers came to have a starling because they found an injured or orphaned, orphaned bird. And since starlings are unwanted by rehab centers, decided to take care of the bird into their own hands. The discussion at the website is lively. And as with any obscure and so social coterie, often veers into the arcane and nerdy, matters that only other starling keepers would care about or understand. Starling Talk members have learned from sad experience that if you have a starling loose in the house, you must avoid leaving a glass of any liquid on the counter that your bird will not lean in to drink. It gets, gets its wings pinned and drowned, 
Close the toilet lid before flushing so the curious bird does not follow the entrancing swirl down the pipe. Take care in using the garbage disposal and make sure before you turn the microwave on that your bird is not somehow slipped inside. Refrain from chopping vegetables with large knives as starlings cannot help investigating with tiny bills and toes that are all too easy to inadvertently slice off. You have to watch your step. Starlings are so completely at home with their human flock families that they are constantly underfoot and it's easy to accidentally trample their tiny, hollow-boned little bodies. One day, I couldn't find Carmen anywhere, and finally, after about an hour of searching, I took a breath, deciding she was probably napping somewhere and would turn up when she was ready. Besides, I was getting hungry. When I opened the refrigerator to get the peanut butter for my sandwich, she jumped off the shelf next to the eggs and rushed to my shoulder. She tried to shake the cold off her feathers, and I tucked her under my shirt to thaw. Poor little thing. I can't imagine how she jumped in there without my knowing. But other than being a bit chilled, she seemed fine. Starlings bring this bright curiosity to the exploration of their world. And only habitats in North America that starlings avoid are large expanses of wooded or forested areas, arid chaparral, and desert. Ornithologist Paul Cobb proclaims that given the starling's omnivorous diet and ability to make use of buildings as nest sites, no native bird in North America, not even the crow, is better adapted to the urban wilds than this invader. It took starlings just 80 years to their release in Central Park to populate the entire continent. Okay, we are going to stop there. Just um, a few pages shy of the end of chapter three of Mozart's Starling by Leander Lynn Hopped. Again, my name is Nalani Brown, philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones. Thank you for listening, and we will pick up in the middle of chapter three next week.